Welcome to this edition of Excavating the Bible, what archaeology can teach us. This program is dedicated to exploring the contributions that archaeologists in the Middle East make to our understanding of and appreciation for the Bible. I'm Doug Clark. I direct the Center for Near Eastern Archaeology at La Sierra University, and I'm joined with my two colleagues, also from La Sierra University, Larry as co-host of this program, mm -hmm. and as longtime archaeologist, Kent. I think we're talking 20-some years, and certainly in the field, but even more mm -hmm. than that if we talk about studying. It is. Archaeology. It has been. So, <laughs> and you are an associate professor of archaeology and the history of antiquity right. at La Sierra, and I think chair, new chair of mm -hmm. the Department of Biblical Studies and Archaeology. Thank you for joining us. We have um, lots of things to talk about, as usual. Right. In fact, I was thinking about reading through the Bible and just kind of paying attention to anything that could have an archaeological connection. Mm -hmm. You'd have to stop at pretty much every third or fourth verse. Yeah. Um, and that's in, in one way why we, why we have some repetition, because some of them refer back to similar sorts of things. Mm -hmm. But they are archaeological and they're illustrative. And as we walk through the Bible, we have come to Jeremiah. Initial kind of responses, maybe even visceral responses to the book of Jeremiah, which is quite visceral, actually. Mm -hmm. It is. <clears throat> you know, to read through, it can be confusing because chronologically, it seems to be quite uh, mixed up. But it is full of wonderful quotations and uh, inspirational things as well as devastatingly uh, gruesome things. So I don't know if it's fair to call it a mixed bag or not, but it's a, uh, a very important prophet. And as you said, there is so much to connect archaeologically with the text. It's amazing how much is there. I don't think that there are as many uh, names from a book that have been found by archaeologists as there are connected to Jeremiah. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, your take on Jeremiah. Well, I think Jeremiah is something of a special book. And special isn't always a good uh, <laughs> modifier, it, but it really is. I remember the summer that I was um, a, a staff counselor at a, at a youth camp and for one staff worship, we shared what book of the Bible we had begun reading. Mm. Just about all of us who were counselors, a very stressful job, <laughs> were reading Jeremiah. Isn't that interesting? It was yeah. surprising. <laughs> we were all surprised. And yet, it was Jeremiah that spoke to us in those circumstances. Uh, uh, so like you said, I think it has some incredible, some incredible promises, right, right. Uh, verses, mm -hmm. that can speak to people uh, at very important times in their life when they need a message. I think deep pathos yes. may reflect mm -hmm. something of the nature of the book, too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm especially thinking now of a passage in Jeremiah 8. There's a conversation going on between God and God's people, mm -hmm. and they, they speak past each other. They're, somehow the people don't hear what God is saying, and there's another line of thought going here. God comes back to the same. The people uh, come back to their same line of thought. And it's within five, six verses, they've missed each other, mm -hmm. and they're filled with deep pathos and pain, mm -hmm. which may be why Jeremiah is known as the heart prophet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when, prophet, uh, when Jeremiah talks about heart stuff, it's the kind of of feeling and pathos that actually makes its way quite easily into the New Testament. Mm -hmm. The notion mm -hmm. of heart, mm -hmm. the notion of knowing God. That comes mm -hmm. from, uh, well, mm -hmm. Jeremiah and Hosea. Mm -hmm. Jeremiah and Hosea share some of that kind of emotive, expressive uh, pathos that maybe reflects well on what you said and the story of the camp. He talks counselors. about people getting new hearts, doesn't he? And the New Testament obviously picks up on that. A new covenant. Yeah, a new covenant, so, right. Mm -hmm. We have several things on the table in front of us. Kent, talk to us about the not so warm and fuzzy stuff that you have on your end. Right, this was the reality of Jeremiah's time when the enemies were approaching and we have illustrations here of some of the primary weapons of, of that time period, the military hardware. Uh, we have uh, some, some daggers here. These haven't, um, I don't think we've had these out before. These are new items. 
to show we have um, these ballistica. These were used as sling stones. Uh, in, at this time, we have Assyrian reliefs showing a whole regiments of soldiers slinging rounded uh, stones like this. Mace heads, again, these would be hafted on a, on a, a stick and used to um, subdue people. We have uh, horse tack, horse hardware here. This is part of a bridle. It's actually the bit, and um, you can see it's ornate. So th these pieces went beyond functional. They were also a statement about the military prowess and power of, of, the, um, of the army that's, that's coming to get uh, Jerusalem. We have arrow points here that were typical of this time period, the Babylonians, as well as uh, the Assyrians before them. And something a little more ceremonial. So probably this wouldn't be on your average soldier, but it would have been on the officers, perhaps. And uh, it's actually uh, an ax head. Um, mm -hmm. it's, this is not for um, carving wood, but it's for militaristic uh, functions. And it um, would be quite functional. Substantial. It would be substantial. <laughs> could split open the skull, couldn't it? Oh, yes. Yeah. We actually have, we've, we have um, record, we have um, found skulls, archaeologically speaking, that have these slice marks going into them mm -hmm. that, you know, certainly the individual wouldn't have survived very long. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We keep bringing military weaponry to this program, but that's in part because it keeps showing up. Right. Mm -hmm. Especially in the prophetic and historical literature where battles are fought all the time, uh, not only literally, but they're used figuratively as well mm -hmm. for different sorts of messages the prophets want to, to convey. So this, this real estate, this uh, area of the world, warfare is uh, not new to now, right. is it? Right, yeah. right, right. Yeah. Larry, you have something maybe more well, domestic yeah, in front of you. That's right. These are things that if uh, Jeremiah were to walk in on us uh, today and see these, he would feel right at home a typical bowl of the period. We're talking about uh, the seventh century, basically, and uh, these vessels which are used for liquids of various kinds. Um, in fact, we were talking just before uh, the show started about uh, Jeremiah's discussion of this very type of pot that he was asked to take and to smash. And uh, by the time you got through with it, it looked more like that than it did here, doesn't it? And then a, a larger container for the linen, yes. the cloth, yes. uh, the, the underwear, basically. Also uh, mentioned in the book. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And uh, a lamp, this would be a typical lamp of the period. Often it had a little um, ring base like this. It started out as a bowl, it was pinched here, so there would be a place for the uh, wick, and then the uh, oil would go in there. And it wouldn't produce a lot of light, but it would be enough light to help you get by for uh, the necessary things after the sun went down. And this cute little um, juglet we have many of. The blackware is typical of this period and probably contains something that was a little more precious, and so it has a narrower mouth mm -hmm. than the others do. And um, this upper millstone would be used in, uh, in preparing grain for, for eating and uh, is mentioned in Jeremiah as well as other places. So food preparation. And it could be a pretty lethal weapon on occasion it as well. It could be oppressive. It could be and oppressive. It actually is used by Jeremiah in that fashion. That's right, yeah, yeah. And then a couple of uh, very small pieces of pottery that actually are broken and somebody found and wanted something utilitarian, wanted something utilitarian, and carved it round and then drilled a hole in the center, and this became what we call a spindle whorl, mm -hmm. and a stick would be placed through that, and this would be the flyweight for, or the flywheel for spinning wool into yarn or with the smaller ones, uh, flax mm -hmm. into linen. Mm -hmm. And we have uh, spinning and weaving mm -hmm. as part of Jeremiah's message mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. I mean, Jeremiah is so rich in metaphors it is. from daily life. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. that's why we see these. We also see a pile of broken shirts. Now, some of these are more interesting to us than others. If they have a rim on them, we call them diagnostics, and we can say something more about them than if they're, what, Kent, it's a body shirt, right? Right, just a 
a piece with no edge, no base, right. no handle. Nothing that indicates the time frame, right. except maybe the, the, the wear of the If it's decorated, itself. maybe some paint thinner right. would be more uh, helpful. These are interesting because, as Larry was saying, a vessel like this was smashed, mm -hmm. and so we end up with pieces like this. These pieces of pottery, as has often been said, while they illustrate brokenness in the Old Testament, they are the bread and butter of, of dirt archaeology. Mm -hmm. um, we use them for chronology and so on. So we have some things to think about here, but we also want to move to some slides about the book itself and about some archaeological connections. And so we look first of all at the outline. Larry, what do we see in this outline? <coughs> well, there are six divisions that uh, you've uh, divided Jeremiah into, and we'll be talking about just the first one in this episode, chapters 1 through 25, where uh, most of the material uh, comes from uh, Jeremiah's uh, counsel, uh, his That's uh, a soft blame, word. <laughs> <laughs> blaming Judah, Jerusalem for what they've, what they've done. Yeah. yeah. And then we'll move next time to, uh, to uh, entries numbers two and three, and then four and, uh, and then four on its own, and then the last two we'll do is the fourth uh, episode. Mm -hmm. Th this book, <clears throat> maybe we should say something about it. This book, although there's an outline here in front of us, this is artificial. Right. There's, it's very hard. It's actually very hard to outline most of the prophetic books, mm -hmm. some mm -hmm. more easily than others. But why is Jeremiah so hard to, uh, to structure the way we like to structure things? I think there's one clue in the story where the words are burned and Baruch has to rewrite, and he says he added um, much more. So we have, straight out of the book, an indication of a complex scribal history to it, it's been added to, probably edited, uh, this part here, Jeremiah's words here. And so when it comes to us, I'm not sure what their plan was and how it was to proceed, but we have to jump around a little bit to right. follow. Some people have even <laughs> thought about sections being written on scrolls and somebody dropped them, they picked them up, and however they picked them up, that, that became the order because it's, it's, uh, it, it doesn't truly seem can. to be a rhyme or reason Yeah, if to one it. wants yeah. to read through and kind of get a chronological narrative, you won't find that in right. Jeremiah. Right. You'll have to go to Kings yeah. uh, or Chronicles. But Jeremiah tends to mix things up in all kinds of creative ways. You, you mentioned Baruch. Tell our viewers a little bit more about who Baruch was. Well, he's the, the, um, the scribe, but he's a, a figure we know archaeologically because we have found seal impressions. Uh, of course, these were used to, to seal a scroll and to indicate that it hadn't been tampered with so the, uh, the clay would be stamped and then tied. Mm -hmm. And then if it were broken, it would be clear that someone had been into that scroll. Well, of course, the scrolls burned mm -hmm. when um, the city burned, but the, the clay bulle, they're called, the stamps, um, survived. So we have actual uh, seal impressions of Baruch. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that mostly is described in chapter 36. Mm -hmm. Well, at least most of the names that we find. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so when we get to that section, we will look at several of those names. Mm -hmm. We'll look at the actual, uh, the, the bulla, as we mm -hmm. call them, these mm -hmm. seal impressions. And then we'll read the text and just kind of do a little bit of comparing. Mm -hmm. uh, chapter 36, I think, is one of the wealthiest chapters when it comes to these kinds of comparisons. It's interesting that you have a prophet who um, may not have written his own material, but it was transcribed or uh, recorded by his uh, secretary or amanuensis. And uh, so a prophet doesn't have to be solely responsible, right. but can use other material and gets help from various people in putting together his or her material. Well, the book of yeah. Jeremiah does tell us a lot about the process, it does, doesn't it? It does, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How somehow a message from God makes it into a text, yeah. which as we'll see in a minute is a complex text mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll, we'll observe that more So it has a, and the text has a context, right? And that's right. what archeology span is so helpful to us for giving us the context of right. all these writings. Right. Mm -hmm. So uh, we've seen this chronology before, although I will confess that I needed to add one king who was only there for three months, and that is Jehoahaz in 609. Somehow he got left off of the earlier list. 
But this again gives us, as you mentioned, Larry, the mm -hmm. context mm -hmm. of, uh, of the prophets. And now we can see where Jeremiah fits into all of this. And then another kind of context, and we'll do this quickly because we've looked at this before, but who was it that said that repetition is the mother, mother of, learning? of learning? Something right. about that. So was it the rabbis who put that uh, statement, so, that saying together? Yeah. So it's got to be important, and teachers <laughs> like it. So uh, Judah, we have seen this before, but um, a good indication of the territory of Judah. The northern kingdom is where? We, I, Israel is not on this map. Israel is no more. Israel is no more. And then, of course, the great empires. Jeremiah lives to see both the Assyrian Empire and its capital here at this particular stage at Nineveh. And then that changes to, um, to the Babylonian Empire. And that, this is about 600 BC that this is listed. Mm -hmm. But uh, we're talking about a major shift in the what? A uh, decade before the change to the uh, next century. And that's the territory that we would call basically Iraq today. Right. Mm -hmm. And then going down to the Fertile Crescent and, mm -hmm. or going down into um, Palestine and even into Egypt and some into Turkey. Okay, so mm -hmm. some notes about the book, the first two, and then about the prophet. What does it mean when we're talking about the longest book in the Bible? There are books that have more chapters. Mm -hmm. So what is this about? By word count, isn't it? So if we actually look at the number of words, Jeremiah would be the longest book of the Bible. Some people have known that, having sat down to read it through as they're reading the Bible through, that this is, this is a long, the chapters are long, mm -hmm. the book is long, and it does seem to keep going. And we can't uh, forget that the divisions into verses and chapters is a much later arrangement. They weren't around during Jeremiah's time. No, no, no. <laughs> And then we have an issue. Um, can I put it that way? Sure. An issue with the translation. What's going on here between the Hebrew and the Greek? The Greek uh, book of Jeremiah in the Septuagint that's uh, noted there as the LXX is shorter than uh, the Hebrew. And so uh, someplace along the way, the people responsible for that tr translation either left out part of the book or maybe they were copying a Hebrew uh, text that didn't have those sections. And um, the Dead Sea Scrolls that were uh, found in the, in the late 40s uh, down uh, by the, uh, the, sea, the Dead Sea uh, have one text in Hebrew that fits that Greek translation. And so evidently there were various uh, editions mm. of Jeremiah's words, some longer and some shorter. And we're not talking about a few words. No. We're talking about somewhere between one eighth and one seventh of the book. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, do, I think that Job is only more uh, reduced. It's one sixth when it goes to the Septuagint. Mm -hmm. It may be for, because of repetitions too. That's true. Um, I've wondered if uh, this doesn't tell us, as we were talking before about how the Bible came to us, mm -hmm. we ought to pay attention to this fact too, that there were no Xerox machines, right. there was no duplicating, one couldn't scan it mm -hmm. and uh, upload it to a computer. So there were all kinds so of... So it's possible that the New Testament writers who wrote in Greek uh, used a shorter version than we have in our own Bibles. Yeah, I, yeah, I think that's an important point. The LXX yeah. was translated a couple hundred years before Jesus. Right. And that's why we often look to it to try to ascertain the early textual tradition. But um, you mentioned the Hebrew uh, text at Qumran, and that's important because they weren't translated from Greek into Hebrew. No. The Hebrew would have a limited audience, and it was always going the other direction. Right, right. So to find that, indeed, there were there was a Hebrew forlaga, mm -hmm. or the, the Hebrew original, um, does tell us that at least that was out there. So mm -hmm. then the question is, which was first? Was it <laughs> the text behind our, our more standard Hebrew Bible, uh -huh. or was it the shorter text? Yeah. And if you look at the differences, most scholars agree that it was probably the shorter uh -huh. text that was original. And I think that most scholars, New Testament scholars, would argue that the Bible, that New Testament uh, authors quoted was more often the Greek than mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. Hebrew. 
-hmm. And that actually helps to explain a number of sort of dilemmas. Mm -hmm. You're reading the New Testament, and then you read the text quoted in the Old Testament. They just, there's, <laughs> there's, the words don't seem always to be the same. Mm -hmm. Well, that's because they used the, Different the Greek version. Mm -hmm. right? And the, the Septuagint became so associated mm -hmm. with early Christianity that the Jewish diaspora, who wanted a Greek version, decided to make a new version altogether and just leave the Septuagint to the Christians. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Lots, of, uh, lots of things going on there. Uh, the weeping prophet, probably because of this heart mm -hmm. um, pathos mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. uh, that the prophet conveys, even in his writings. And then we have um, a couple of other notes. We might have more time in the future to come back to those. But they do indicate that Jeremiah was long lived. I mean, mm -hmm. he, this mm -hmm. was not a, a one or two year stint mm -hmm. of being a prophet. He didn't want to be one to start with. And this was, this was a long time. He was hidden down in a hole for a while, too. He, so. he, he was. <laughs> so we'll take a look at some of these connections. Um, Asher Banapal's library, which dates to about when, Ken? Well, um, it was destroyed in, you know, in the destruction of Nineveh, so that, that puts it in the... 612. Um, huh? Yeah, 612, so the later part of the 7th century. And oh, it's just a brilliant um, we, we'll, snapshot we have into a couple the great literature of that time. That to, to illustrate that. And Ashurbanipal, of course, is an Assyrian king who was an early archaeologist. He sort of collected <laughs> texts from around the kingdom and put them together in his library. I, you say that with a smile, Larry, and I think that suggests <laughs> that you like collecting things. Only we collect books, not tablets, and so... I think you better stop no, before no, you no, tell all no, my secrets. No, I, I think it's terrific. I, I mean, we have in the center now mm -hmm. your library mm -hmm. because you were willing to do that, and you paid for those books. That's true. Um, but it's... it's it, it, you're, Asher Banapal II here. <laughs> I see, yeah. So we'll have to think about that. So, and we have some other things that we'll uh, take a look at too. Kent, talk to us about Asher Banapal's library. Well, they were organized and cataloged. Unfortunately, when the library was excavated, the tablets were kind of dumped in with some other collections. We can't recreate the library. We wish we could. But it had niches, and these tablets could be placed in the niches and in individuals who, who were literate could go and, and look up and read various texts from the ancient world. Including ones like? The great story of Gilgamesh. The flood story. The flood it, story. Part of it has the, the story of the individual who made it through the flood and was granted uh, eternal life as, right. as like the that. story is told here. Right. So a very important part of the world uh, at this point. That's this right. Point, so. Probably the most popular story judging from the time period that we have fragments of, of this and also the range of Co the location. Copies of this story in cuneiform go back before the time of Moses, they interestingly do. enough. So they, they were widely dispersed, this flood story, throughout mm -hmm. the ancient right. Near East. We also have in this section of Jeremiah passages and speeches about the wild animals that mm -hmm. will overtake you mm -hmm. or they will become your enemy. And, or the enemy is compared with wild animals. Mm -hmm. Now these may not be wild, these are mostly domestic uh, bones, but archeologists find bones. We they find, uh, we can reconstruct the ecosystems because of the bones we find. And we might say that uh, our excavation in Jordan was the first excavation, scientific right. excavation, that really went about keeping all the bones for study. Yeah. And we do that with all of them now, mm -hmm. and that's, that's a huge amount. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to get to this next one. So, uh, a relief. And this one is suggested as a Babylonian relief. Mm -hmm. It looks a lot like the Assyrians, mm -hmm. and maybe a, not much changed. Between they were contemporaries, so it's mm -hmm. not surprising that they'd right. be similar in many ways. Right. Okay, some artifacts. Um, I'm not sure if a cistern is an artifact, but it is something made, made by humans. It's so. made by humans. We'll, we'll, we'll include it this time. And then, of course, we've got the, the, the deities, the idols, and so on. The Queen of Heaven, um, the Asherim, etc. cetera. Um, weapons, we've seen some of those. So let's take a look at some of them. This one is a uh, cistern from the southwest part of Israel. And this one looks like it's out in a field. But Jeremiah encountered a cistern. What was that story about? Often cisterns were put uh, 
in the basements of buildings so that they could be readily available when people needed to get their water. Mm -hmm. Carved out mm -hmm. and plastered mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. prevent water leakage. Mm -hmm. Actually, it's later on that we will bump into uh, cisterns again because Jeremiah ends up being tossed into one mm -hmm. as a punishment mm -hmm. toward the very end, mm -hmm. the, the last days <laughs> of, uh, the, of the kingdom. So I want to think now about a uh, smelting oven. Lots of these around. Um, but especially in the southern parts of Israel mm -hmm. and Jordan, mm -hmm. where we have the iron, uh, where we have the ore that is used. Linen. Um, Jeremiah talks about linen. Uh, we have the Egyptian scenes here. I don't know how many of the tombs come up with linen, but this is a, kind of a daily life sort of thing. Very popular in Egypt, right. yeah. Right. Makes better underwear than wool. <laughs> it does. A lot and less And Egyptians scratchy. used it for that. Right. Mm -hmm. In fact, we have to think about that with, um, with the priests. They mm -hmm. were supposed to wear mm -hmm. linen mm -hmm. uh, undergarments, mm -hmm. which is a nice way to say underwear, <laughs> right. um, in order to prevent sweating, mm -hmm. because that would be a bodily emission which would render them ritually unclean to function in the temple. And those really were the only two options. Cotton comes in. Well, later. about now, but it's much yeah. later than most of the history. Right, right. So we have several uh, scenes here, well, with several artifacts that we want to think about. Pottery shows up a lot, and we won't have time to go through all of this, but um, clay mm -hmm. as a descriptor for uh, creation. Mm -hmm. it, Jeremiah 18, mm -hmm. uh, go mm -hmm. down to the potter's mark, uh, mm -hmm. to the potter's shop and see that the potter is making a vessel, mm -hmm. as in making a person. Mm -hmm. We see that in uh, Mesopotamian texts as well. And then some other kinds of things, the grinding stones we've already looked at, and lamps, uh, drinking cups, we've looked mm -hmm. at those as well. Kent, Egyptian again, you like Egyptian stuff. Well, they often illustrate so nicely for us the technologies and, and daily life processes of the time. And again, we have an illustration here of, of pottery making. The whole stage, you know, going from bringing in the clay to um, shaping it, um, and then putting it in the kiln. Yeah, the whole process. Not too much different. In fact, where we work in Jordan, it's Egyptian potters who come into the country every summer when Even it's now. dry. Mm -hmm. And they're the ones who make the pottery mm -hmm. for local use, utilitarian use, yeah. primarily. Okay, Kent, another thing here. You, you think about these wheels as yeah, you're the working with pottery, right? On the right-hand side there, we actually have, we find sometimes potter's wheels. And here's a base, and then the top spins on that, on that um, uh, protuberance. And you can actually shape the, the clay. Not as easily as a, a modern potter's wheel, but it worked. Right, right, right. And there's where it is where we meet it. I mean, okay, we excavate it, and then we bring it to the table and we try to uh, sort out what it means, like our pile of pottery right, here on, right. the on the table. Thank you, Larry. Thank you, Kent. And thank all of you for joining us for this edition of Excavating the Bible. We hope this has provided something for your intellectual and your spiritual journey, and we look forward to next time. Until then, think ancient, keep believing, and keep exploring. For Excavating the Bible, I'm Doug Clark.